Excellencies, good morning. It's great to be here, and I really appreciate the uh, organizers inviting me to uh, give a presentation. After the uh, positive outlook Mr. Gabrielli gave and uh, the minister gave on the, the future, I think it is appropriate that we do look at Macondo uh, and look at how that will impact our next steps. So this morning, I would like to give you a short presentation on actually the response that occurred during the Macondo incident and kind of give you a size of uh, what we had to face in the U.S. And then perhaps just a couple nuggets for what we need to consider as we move forward. And I think hopefully that'll uh, stimulate some conversation within the, uh, within the group. First off, uh, this gives a picture of uh, the extent of the surface oil from the spill. It's a, it's a, it's a conglomerate picture. I mean, not, oil wasn't there all the time, but it shows where it was uh, throughout the spill. It kind of gives you a, the size and complexity of what we were faced. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our response organization, the challenges we faced, and then a little bit on the lessons we learned. First off, the challenges that we faced is that there was a beginning to this incident. But until it ended, we didn't know there was an end. It was like having a major oil spill every day for 87 days in a row. When you think about that, that, that really stresses your response organization. And this is not the largest oil spill in history. I believe that belongs to, uh, in Kuwait, after the Iraq invasion, I think there was more oil spilled in the ground then, but this was ranks right up there. As you all know, we do have a variety of investigations. We had a President's Commission. The Coast Guard is doing an investigation with uh, BOMER. Um, the Coast Guard has released its part of the investigation. BOMER has still has not, which is kind of unfortunate as their investigation focuses more on the down well, what happened down there, which really is kind of the root cause. But I can tell you that we are, uh, we have taken what has happened and the, and the investigations that haven't come out to date and we're looking forward. So here this is a, uh, just a picture kind of pictorial of what was going on in the response and I've just if you pardon me, I just want to read a few statistics to give you kind of a, a size of what we were faced. 4.9 million barrels of oil were spilled. At the peak, we had 48,200 responders in action. We had 9,700 vessels involved in the response. And I can assure you, that's larger than any Navy in the world. We deployed 3.8 million feet of hard boom, 9.7 million feet of soft boom. 6.8 million liters of dispersants were used. We had 411 in situ burns. And we, reportedly, we burned over 265,000 barrels of oil. We used 127 surveillance aircraft. We had four incident command posts in the different states, the coastal states that were affected, and it goes on and on. Within my organization, the Coast Guard, we had 7,000 people involved, 60 vessels and 22 aircraft. And it, also during the response, there was the international assistance. We had 68 offers of foreign assistance from uh, countries. We were able to accept 47. This is one thing I want to mention a little bit later on, is, is how countries can better utilize the offers of assistance coming in from foreign governments. Uh, governments that did provide assistance, Canada, Mexico, Norway, Japan, Germany, France, UK, Tunisia, Belgium, Qatar, Kenya, China, Russia, Netherlands, and Sweden. You'll note there is a strong Scandinavian uh, assistance provided to us. This picture here is uh, the response organization we had nationally. And I, I know most countries have their own response organizations and this is nothing really unique. Just want to point out a couple things. POTUS, that's the US acronym for President of the United States, so it does show that he ultimately is in charge of it. And then the red box, uh, the National Incident Command. That was led by Admiral Thad Allen. He was the Commandant of the Coast Guard. He also led the response in the Katrina the hurricane hit New Orleans. Uh, and then between him was Secretary Napolitano with DHS. 
Now, what down below is what's called the Unified Area Command. And that's where the, uh, the, the state and the local, the federal government, and then the RP and the stakeholders come together. During most normal, and I don't want to use that term uh, too frequently, but the usual oil spills we have in the U.S., all we would do is have an organization that goes up to Unified Area Command. But because this was so much more significant and involved the president, this shows that it's a national incident of, of significance. This uh, talks a little bit about our response system. I think that after everything was calmed down a little bit and we looked at our response system that we had put in place in the United States, we came to the conclusion that our national contingency plan actually was pretty good. We had established it in 1968, and it was a coordinated plan for responding to oil spills and uh, disasters. We've amended it a number of times. The most recent time that we amended it was in Open 90 after the Exxon Valdez, which strengthened provisions in the plan, primarily uh, establishing a relationship between the federal government, the RP, the responsible party, in this case it was BP, those who spill, the obligation of the RP to pay. Uh, but in general, we thought that that worked very good and we don't see any need to change that. However, if you look, that there was a report, the National Incident Commander did a report, and he reported that the National Contingency Plan was politically and socially nullified by the lack of familiarity and the desire for control. What we had, the problem we had in this response was the tension between the states and the local governments and their desire to control the response and really what was established by uh, Doctrine, policy, and law was a need for that response to be directed from above. And that existed throughout the entire uh, uh, spill response. The solution that we see forward in that is to make sure that when you do exercises, when you plan for this and you look forward, is you need to make sure that we need to make sure that we get the local states more involved so they actually understand the, the structure and how it works. Some of the initial lessons uh, that we learned from this response, you need to take into account the community and the health of the local communities. In this case, it was the fisheries that uh, really were uh, really hurt, the people, uh, the destruction of their livelihood, the strain on them mentally. You need to set up provisions to take care of them. If you don't, it's going to be a very, it's going to be a difficult political problem, and it's going to make the response even more uh, problematic. Economic recovery of the area. Of course, that's key, and that's still ongoing. And then, and then lastly, the long-term environmental recovery. A number of studies from spills in history have shown that usually there is a recovery, but of course the people living there would like to see it uh, sooner rather than later. Incorporating some best practices that we were able to uh, learn from the response. Achieving the unity of effort within the federal government. In the U.S., there were 34 federal agencies involved. And I don't know about if any of you involved trying to get federal agencies to work together, oftentimes that's like herding cats. Uh, so to get them to come together and have a unity of effort probably was one of the most difficult tasks for the National Incident Commander, uh, Admiral Allen. So that, that is something that you need to look, f that has to be planned for and has to be uh, exercised. Airspace control. One of the things they learned right away uh, Admiral Allen mentioned that he, at one time he was talking to the president, and the president said, is there anything I can do for you? He says, sir, yes. He says, give me control of the airspace. And they did. And that was absolutely key to be able to put airplanes and surveillance aircraft up in the air to plan response to see the extent of the oil. You can imagine the news, everybody else trying to get a look at it, that if you didn't, uh, it hampered the response. And not only that, it was very dangerous. Secondly, you need to have good science and technology support. When you're looking at how you're going to respond, the things you're going to do, you need to have the key people brought together that they can look at those and evaluate your options and advise the response uh, uh, structure. If that doesn't exist, then you're left floundering. They were able to establish those. Uh, they did it in Houston, and it turned out to be very, very beneficial to the response. And, and along with that, of course, the technologies. 
they opened up, they had a website where people could submit uh, ideas for response. I think they received over 3,000 uh, response ideas, and actually, uh, they, they looked at them. And I think maybe John maybe has better stats on that. He can, he can provide it. Some other lessons. Uh, obviously, this has made the United States, and in particular the Coast Guard and uh, BOMER, our sister agency, we're looking very, very closely at our regulations. Are they, are they adequate? And it, the regulations I'm talking about, not only from the construction and the operation of the equipment, the down well equipment, also, have we adequately prepared? One of the things we, we found out was that BOMER, the sister agency, was responsible for making sure that the operator had planned for the spills. We, who are responsible for responding if there was a spill, were not that knowledgeable of the response plan. So there's a gap that we need to close. And I think also the size of this spill has pointed out that we need to consider what is a large spill that we need to account for in the response plans. Um, international. The MODU code has come up. I think also the issue of international standards for drilling, down well standards, that has also come up. Whether or not they're uh, advisory, recommendatory, could be mandatory, those kinds of things are, are now being raised. And certainly our relationship with foreign flag units which come and operate on our shelf, the Coast Guard is looking very closely at how we manage that and how we manage that risk. And then lastly, the, the thing I'd like to point out is just that the prescriptive versus the safety case, that issue is ongoing. How we're going to resolve that, it seems to me, in, in my role, if I look forward, we're, we're going to need to include provisions or part of the safety case or include that in our regulatory scheme. And how we match that up with any kind of prescriptive requirements remains to be seen. But I think that we're looking at some type of hybrid that takes advantage of, the, of both, uh, both systems. And I think with that, I'll close. I hope you give an idea of what we faced during the response, some of the initial lessons that we learned. We're still waiting for the final outcome of uh, the investigations. The Coast Guard had their investigation. It was released in an unusual manner. Usually the Commandant of the Coast Guard responds to the recommendations. That has not occurred yet. We're working on those. And once that is done, that will really let everyone know how the Coast Guard is going to proceed as we move forward. So with that, thank you. <laughs>